Hi, my name is Lance Oppenheim. I'm the director of Some Kind of Heaven, and uh, thank you for having me today. Hi, my name's Elaine. Hi, my name is Elaine. Hi, my name is Elaine. Elaine is our name. The village is like being on vacation every day. The Disney World for retirees. It is like going off to college. You come here to live. You don't come here to pass away. There is no place like this. This is Nirvana. I'm just saying, for me, it hasn't been the fantasy land that I thought it would be. For, you know, for reasons that are, some are true to my own self, you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> I think that when you live in the villages, you're acting the part. Surely, everybody's life is not perfect. Now that we're in the villages, Reggie's sense of reality has become even more out there. I came down here to meet a nice looking lady with some money that I'd be not embarrassed to be seen on the street with. You need a handyman, don't you? I don't care. Who am I? You got the answer. No, I don't. They're in you. Who am I? Somebody found me out. I got in trouble with the law last night. You're charged with possession of cocaine. Who am I? You make me sick. I think I lose no matter what you do. If you want to avoid trouble, don't come here. There has to be more than just surviving. It's a new awakening. This is the last hurrah. I'm about ready to call it quits. We have too much fun down here, you know? That is a trailer from the documentary Some Kind of Heaven, and this is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood, and today we're catching up with one of the leading up-and-coming filmmakers in the documentary world, Lance Oppenheim. Lance made his feature directorial debut last year with Some Kind of Heaven, but many of you will have been aware of his work from a while, for a while at least through his delightful shorts on New York Times Op Docs. So uh, without further ado, uh, Lance, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? I am good, and thank you for, uh, I, I wish I could shrink you and put you in my pocket if you were, uh, were hyping me up all the time. That would be making me feel a lot better <laughs> about my life, so thank you. Well, it's, it's very generous of you. Well, well, likewise, I was telling someone, like, I think we all feel like we need to have a documentary director following us around through our <laughs> lives, you know, so uh, so I'd love for you to do be able to do that for me. Um, the... Uh, Again, the feature uh, is uh, Some Kind of Heaven, uh, premiered at Sundance. Um, I know Magnolia Pictures and uh, Dog Wolf here in the UK have picked it up, but has it had a wider release yet? Where, where can people see this? So the film is actually going to be available, um, I believe, uh, anywhere Hulu is uh, okay. on, on May 15th. So uh, that will be hopefully... Uh, a larger release. I know. I know we're doing. I think there's different partners we have in Australia. Um, I think Mad Men is or s s someone. You know, I'm not totally sure, but well, I know that there are uh, other regions of the planet that the movie will be available <laughs> on. Um, but it will be available to stream on May 15th via Hulu. Okay. Well, um, that's that's good to know and good to hear. And uh, people, if you're not in in at access to Hulu, then um, as we always suggest, just Google it, and you, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, the uh, and then I want to congratulate you uh, on your uh, di directorial debut in terms of a feature um, and the distribution deals and the acclaim the film has has gotten. Um, and been wanting to have you on for a little while because I've I've watched uh, what was it? Um, uh, well, I've seen your shorts on Op Docs uh, a few years ago. And was very impressed uh, with the uh, the happiest guy in the world. Was it? Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of my favorites, actually. But uh, we're here to talk about some kind of heaven, mostly. Uh, what for those who haven't seen it? Uh, most people will not have seen it since it's not coming out 
to wider release till the 15th. Um, what is Some Kind of Heaven all about? Well, um, it's Some Kind of Heaven's about a, I, I guess, ostensibly, it's a portrait of a place. It's a portrait of a place called The Villages, Florida, uh, the world's largest and for my money's worth, probably the strangest retirement community, a place that's kind of like a Truman Show in real life, uh, designed to simulate the good old days and bring uh, bring baby boomers back to a time they were familiar with from their youth. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the movie does some other things too. It's it's a portrait of uh, also this kind of an existential condition in what happens when you move into uh what 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 may seem like a dream or a fantasy and uh that dream becomes a nightmare uh and it it's a portrait of three residents and i guess you'd say one interloper uh who are on the margins of the fantasy um and it as the movie goes on it becomes more of a portrait of three uh four people real people going through real problems against the backdrop of a very strange uh surreal place but um yeah well, well, it's funny. It's uh, always hard to give a log line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or a synopsis even. I mean, I think, yeah. uh, well, let's let's start with the, the place. Let's start with the villages. Um, yeah. I think as it's been referred to as, uh, I don't know if this is so accurate, actually, but Disneyland for retirees. Uh, it struck me as 50 to 60 suburbia meets uh, vacation resort meets Truman Show, as you've already said. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminded me a bit of Edward Scissorhands. Um, it... Uh, like you already said, it, it, I mean, it even gets mentioned in political discussions. I mean, I remember watching the 2020 presidential race, and they're talking mm -hmm. about the villages. How is that going to impact the result in Florida, for instance? Um, so, I mean, as you you've described, it's the strangest uh, strangest retirement center in your your estimation. But uh, I mean, how did you? I mean, <laughs> maybe give people a little better sense of what this place is like it just seems a bit uh, a bit surreal yeah surreal is a good uh word for it i mean i you know i i, I guess i my familiarity with 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 everything around that world uh will be is different than i imagine uh viewers in the uk and across the planet that aren't from america or even from florida would have but i i grew up knowing of the villages um from the time i was you know a in the seventh grade at the time when I was 12 years old, yeah. I, um, I, 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 I knew of the villages because I am from Florida and on a slow news day in Florida, anytime, you know, there is, uh, nothing really to report. They would, uh, they would recirculate news that came from central Florida where the villages is, uh, and they would treat the villages more or less as the end of a punchline. When I, when I first learned of it, I, I had known of it as a very large retirement community, um, but I had also known of it for sort of the hedonistic practices and activities and pursuits that um, that different um, the different residents of the, of the community uh, lived. And that was, I think, really the um, what made the place become a tall tale in Florida. And uh, as if you know anything about Florida, uh, it's it takes a lot to become a tall tale because things are very <laughs> insane as is uh, there. So. Growing up, there are all kinds of stories about, you know, a rumor, a tall tale about the place having the uh, about this about the community having one of the highest rates of STDs uh, in Florida, which I think was later debunked. But mm. stories like that were on set by um, by by other stories about residents having sex in public and being arrested and. Anyway, it was a. Uh, if you're thinking about retirement USA, a retirement mecca where the country goes to, this would be it. It's the fastest growing, uh, you know, it's one of the fastest growing cities in America, which is totally uh, bonkers. And one of the things that I think mm. drew me back to making a film about the place, um, because it became more of a phenomenon that so many folks were, were moving there and isolating themselves from, uh, you know, I guess what one would maybe say is like an everyday reality. Mm. Um, but it also is uh, the last time I checked, it is the largest retirement community on the planet. So it, it, the implications of, of, of this world, which again is designed and, uh, it, you know, is artificially constructed to remind people of an America that once existed, or maybe an America that never really was, mm. Mm. um, those were the things that jumped out to me as not only being very cinematic to explore, but as a, as a setting, as a subject, as a, again, as a phenomenon of, of, of why people choose to live, uh, people who are over the age of 50 or 60 
uh, why they choose to isolate themselves and, uh, you know, in a cocoon of, of, a sur- of a sort, that popped out at me for sure. Hmm. I, I th- yeah, that's, a, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. As you say, it's this sort of artificial construct. They have their own made up history, for lack of a way of putting it, uh, uh, even founding dates on buildings that are not nonsensical, right? I mean, uh, mm-hmm. you've got, uh, seems to be sealed off from the rest of the world. Um, there's no children. It's like the, whatever, that kingdom in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I mean, it's like there's, uh, uh, you know, own news network with hard-hitting news <laughs> that we see. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I I guess you've already answered, but have you ever seen anything like this or replicated anywhere else? This seems extremely <laughs> unique. Well, I mean, not with my own eyes, but I think one of the things that also drew me just to wanting to make something about the place is I feel like growing up in a, in, in Florida, a diff, very different form of Floridian suburban isms, I guess. I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 I grew up very far away from things in Florida. And um, I feel like the way I began to relate to the world was watching movies and some of my favorite movies I felt like were reflections of where I grew up, you know, mm. Edward Scissorhands being one of them. Um, but even looking at Blue Velvet and, and uh, I think I, I grew up in a very conservative part of Florida to some degree and, um, you know, images out of like the Ronald Reagan Morning in America uh, presidential advertisement uh, also looked not only like the villages, but also, a, you know, a community that I used to grow up in, just the white picket fences mm. um, and obviously <laughs> as art imitates life and life imitates art, it's, it's no matter how or where you move, uh, no matter how much manicuring you do to your backyard or your front yard, mm-hmm. uh, your problems persist. And there is something like as, as going back to like Nicholas Ray's bigger than life uh, or even Todd Haynes is safe, just portraits of mm-hmm. suburban of, of suburbia, uh, of suburban sprawl that be- can become hellish and poisonous. Uh, all those things came to my mind when I first saw the villages. And when I, uh, you know, when I was doing my research, I just was kind of fascinated that so many of the images in their, uh, you know, in one of their um, inf- infomercials was titled Come Visit. Uh, it looked just like all the images that I'm talking about. It looked it almost, mm. it seemed like if they weren't aware of those uh, of, of these movies, I, 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 like it, it would have been mind boggling. Like I, what I really do think, no matter how or how you feel about the community as a construct and the fact that it exists, mm. um, they did do something quite impressive that I don't think anyone else uh, has really cracked, at least in the states here, which is to create, uh, you know, which is to Disneyfy death, Disneyfy the experience mm. of retiring, creating a, a massive. Um, self-contained city that you never have to leave um, that all feels very specific, very distinct, very much like its own, um, its own place. Um, mm. So a lot of those things were just fascinating to me. And as someone, you know, m- most of my work concerns, I think, you know, kind of people, residents who permanent residents of, of impermanent, semi-permanent, temporary li- liminal spaces um, I was just fascinated by this. I made the movie about the man living on a cruise ship, which was another form of, of, uh, of, of, a, of a person escaping reality um, to, into a kind of a, you know, a, a city or a realm they control that is completely mm. defined by id and, and, and pleasure. Um, and I saw this story and that, that this setting as a natural extension of, of where I was going and knowing that I wanted to keep going in that direction. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. There's some great imagery uh, in there, and also your your short that's recently gone on Opdocs, the Paradise Next Door, and the the aerial photos, probably drone, whatever. But it, you know, just that that layout of of almost stereotypical America, suburbia. I think you and I are ge- separated by a generation and grew up uh, well, probably about a thousand and fifteen hundred miles apart. But uh, um, when I saw Edward Scissorhands as a as a young man back when I was a young man, I think uh, it was like I would turn to people. That's exactly where I grew up. You know, it was it was it is there is so there is this there is this uniqueness to Florida, but there's this almost universality at least in terms mm-hmm. of America's suburbia. But in but how would you describe the uh, the denizens of of the villages? I mean, backgrounds wealth attitudes or is it is it can you is there i guess there's probably a stereotype and then there's uh, did you find that reality to be much different or is there a variety of 
of backgrounds that we're talking about here? I mean, you know, as any city goes, I mean, there's about 140,000 people there now, I believe. So it's it it would be it would it would be hard to generalize if there was one specific person. I mean, I think that the stereotype it has and the reputation it has in America as a result of all the events of, you know, leading up to the 2020 election, uh, including this infamous video of a a uh, golf cart rally, golf cart parade in President Trump, or no longer president, thank God, mm-hmm. but uh, Trump's name. Um, and there was a man who was a, a, a Trump supporter who was shouted by power. It went viral. And then it cast a long shadow, I think, on every resident of the villages and, and, and also how we view the villages. It no longer became a, uh, you know, I think... It's, its status, I think, in the way I was interested in looking at it as, as this phenomenon of people isolating themselves, bubbling, you know, uh, jo- joining the ranks or leaving our society to join the ranks of their own. Um, a lot of those things, I think, became secondary. And I think most of the primary focus surrounding the villages uh, is exactly what you will look up if you if you Google it, I think. Places like the Daily Mail love talking about how yeah, it's, exactly. it's it's a uh, it's 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 a it's a home for uh, you know for the most advocate vocal supporters of of Trump, um, and to some degree, I mean, I, I think that that I don't think that always was what it is. I do think there is a large you know it's a ninety eight point three percent white, very conservative, very homogenous population. Obviously, there are many people, there are folks in this film, um, you know, are, are not Trump supporters. Not that that really uh, motivated my, my, you know, my selection or, or, or mm. my decision to follow them. To me, I was less interested in, 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 in the binaries of conservative or Democrat. I think the things I was much more interested in is, again, this is a thing that is happening in our country that mm. we are losing a giant section of our population to this age segregated fantasy world. And what is that experience like? What is that existential condition like? What is that? What is, what does it mean to exist there and not feel at home? Um, mm. Those, especially when time is so short and you're in your eighth chapter, or your eighth decade of navigating this planet. So those questions to me were much more pertinent and interesting. And as a filmmaker uh, who I try to resist falling under those binaries of, you know, mm. conservative or Democrat, or uh, despite being, you know, I, I would consider myself a very liberal person, but also, you know, looking at the villages, is it good or is it bad? I mean, I, I don't, I don't care exactly. about those things. I, I'm much more interested in exploring the gray area and doing what, um, what I think cinema can do best, which is, giving you a very detailed, very rich, uh, expressive mm. uh, exploration of, of emotions, of, of people, of ideas. I think, you know, so much journalism is, is so concentrated in the other mm. side of things that I'm, even if I were to make the movie today, I'm sure I would slip in different details in the interstitial moments, but I think the main, main focus would remain the same. Mm. Well, and, and I think that's, I think you've achieved that. And I think it's very much, much appreciated. I mean, how did you, how did you relate with them? I mean, you're uh, separated by probably at least 50 years, I think, <laughs> with many of the, your subjects. Um, but yet, I mean, what struck me is, uh, at least the ones you concentrate on, we'll talk more about them shortly. Um, they're struggling with the same issues we all are, aren't they? I mean, sort of the meaning of life, how to be happy, searching for love. I mean, is that... Uh, is, I mean, maybe you can say a little something about how, you know, how did they react to a young filmmaker? I mean, how did this, how did you find that? Well, I mean, I think part part of the special thing that happened while making this movie, and it happened very early in my, in my, you know, in my, my travels there, I, I, um, I was the very age, I think that a lot of people who were moving there um, we're trying to return back to, you know, there was mm. this Peter Pan syndrome that everyone uh, goes through there. And it's it not, it, you know, and, and in my own life, I was undergoing my own version of a Peter Pan syndrome. I was about to graduate from college. This was my thesis in school. Yeah. I was terrified of a lot of things. Um, yeah, I was questioning the nature of you know, marriage more generally within my family. And then also my, um, not that I was planning on getting married to my uh, girlfriend at the time, but 
I ended a very intense and very serious relationship and I, and I had a lot of th thoughts on my mind. So yeah. I got there and I think there was a level to which this mutual, I don't know, curiosity, I think was piqued by my age and also by, um, you know, by, by, by the fact that they, most people were, were open to connecting with me and, 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 and chatting with me, not as, uh, someone who looked like their grandson, but someone who in some ways embodied mm. the same spirit that, that they were having, especially the folks that are at the center of this film. And um, as a result, I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm happy you're saying what you're saying. Cause I, 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 you know, I don't even see this necessarily as a one-to-one -one portrait of the villages. I see this as more, you know, I see this as a, a very different, very specific portrait of what it means to, to grow old and, the thing that I really tried to do when making this film was I didn't want the movie to feel like it was a film about older people. I wanted it to feel like it was a film about people, you know, a film that could have been made by the, my favorite filmmakers like Cal Ashby or, you know, Robert Altman or any of, you know, felt like a, a, a classic Hollywood kind of ensemble piece um, that, that, that was dealing with ideas and topics and, you know, styles that, that we, we normally don't see, uh, in, in, in documentaries and that felt, you know, were completely evolved from the setting. Hmm. Well, I think, uh, I also think it would be great to, um, maybe let's focus a little bit on these, uh, these four individuals that you do focus in, uh, focus on, uh, uh, and say a little bit of something about them. I mean, how did you, how did you hook up with Barbara and Dennis and Reggie and Anne? I mean, did you did you have a broad? You cast your net wide and then decide after being there for a while. No, these are the four I'm going to focus on. Or how did how did that work out? It was it was definitely it was an evolution uh, for sure. I mean, I, I met Barbara funnily enough my first night in the villages. I, I went to the acting club, which you know I I um mm -hmm. I figured if I was going to find anyone that would not be afraid of being on camera, I would find them there. Yeah. And she was one of the few people who wasn't participating in the club. She was just observing. And I, you know, I gave a little speech of my own. I went up after everyone was finishing their performances and I just introduced myself and said I was there and wanted to make a film. I wasn't sure what the film was going to be about. Um, I was in college and I wanted to get to know people. And Barbara came up to me after I, you know, at the end of the class and she just, uh, I could immediately just tell the amount of just the, the wonderful expression on her face and how um, in tune, I think, with her emotions she is. And mm -hmm. I think we really just gravitated towards each other. She, she and I were kind of connected on a, on a very fundamental wavelength that I don't think I really saw in other people um, and, and, and probably other people didn't see in me at the time. Mm -hmm. But um, each person, I mean, Dennis, Reggie, Anne, I mean, it was all like there felt like there was that level of, of, knowing that they all that we all needed to make a film together um but it did take quite a while to figure out what that film was going to be and how it was going to happen i mean i was following uh several other people and as you mentioned i released a, a, another kind of a short film with the op docs um mm -hmm. with the new york times that has some of the stories that didn't make it into this into the feature but i think um and th you know, for a, for a while, I was following those other stories, the sinkholes yeah. that were bubbling up, and sort of the ecological destruction that the villages was causing yeah. the neighboring you know communities. Uh, the the um, but as I kept going deeper and deeper with Barbara and Reggie Anne and Dennis, I think what slowly came to my mind was something that also my editor Daniel Garber informed me of, but. Um, that this was really a film about relationships to a certain degree. And mm. obviously there's a lot of things going on, but, um, but we're looking at this community from the lens and the vantage point of, you know, a married couple who is dealing with a very specific kind of dysfunction. Um, and we're, they're, yes. they're kind of going through a bit. We, so we won't do, because most people haven't seen it, so we won't do any spoilers, but uh, yeah. I mean, it, it does feel like they're going through a midlife crisis, except they're in their, I gather they're in their seventies, but yeah, it's kind of a, no, you know, you're, you're landing on something. Cause exactly. Like the thing I was going to say is that I wanted to feel like, you know, the spirit of like a John Hughes movie, but for this age group, I mean, I, I wouldn't, yeah. I, I feel like that was a, a big broad ambition I have. And when I look at it now, I probably, I don't think it has much to do with John Hughes, but I like this idea that like the, the coming of age story 
can very much apply to a character like Dennis, you know, a person who mm. is uh, 83 years old and is still living his life in the exact same way as he was when he was my age. But he is, um, you know, he, he does grow over the course of the film. And I think your understanding and your experience, your, your, the way one relates with him on screen is it also grows just kind of mirroring the same mm. way I think I felt about him and, I felt about the place for that matter too, as a whole. Yeah. I mean, fair enough to describe Dennis, I guess, as a Lothario. I mean, uh, just so people know what we're what it's we're like dealing an, with. An, an attempted Lothario, but failed. Attempted. Yeah, yeah, a, a, yeah fa- a really a failed been... gigolo. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> and there's, I mean, I won't share it because there's something else in there that just surprised me. But you, you've got it in the film. But uh, uh, and then you've got Barbara, who just seems, as you said, you connected with her, and she just seems a little out of place here, doesn't she? I mean, she's. Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's a very, uh, she's still working, she's she, a bit s- more serious. I mean, I don't know, it's an interesting one to kind of a counter counterpoint. I guess I guess this is a point of how representative are these people of of the villages or as, or as maybe you probably have already basically have said, it's hard to really, you know, generalize and stereotype that each one of these is their own individual and they just happen or just happen to be at the villages. I mean, I, I don't think I, I wouldn't say that these, these four people are representative of, of the villages as a whole. And I don't think that's really the position uh, that I, that the film takes mm-hmm. either. I mean, I think this is a very, um, you know, I think the thing that I was more interested in looking at here, are these are four people on the margins of this fantasy world. And, um, when you look at people at the extremes of a society, of a community, I think you can get to understand the mainstream a lot more and the way people live their lives. And that was that, that, that kind of logic informs the way the movie operates, right? Where we bounce between, we toggle between one of these uh, three storylines. And then the fourth storyline, so to speak, is the, are these interstitial bites of the villages and what the status quo at the villages is, you know, um, more, more generally and, and how, uh, I guess, folks, how a sense of com- community is, is, is formed through conformity. Okay. And I think, um, I mean, the, the other thing that struck me, um, and then I think we're going to take a, a, a quick break uh, for our listeners or viewers, for those on YouTube. Um, these are people who haven't found that, you know, they're in their twilight years, last or next to last chapter, and uh, haven't found the answers yet have they mm. and and may never find the answers that's true no i and i i think that's um that 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 sentiment and i think that that sentiment is really what what is at the heart of the movie uh i i i like and it, it, it stretches back to what the title of the film is some kind of heaven mm. you can read that as mm. uh, a very despairing ironic uh kind of a, you know, truly uh, desolate uh, outlook on life. But I also think there's something really beautiful to that idea that, you know, no matter how old you get, you're never, you never stop becoming. There's something Mm. really beautiful to that, to that concept that even when you are, you know, when, when you are in your final or you're nearing your final chapter of living, you know, there is a beauty to not knowing all the answers of life and continuing to search for them. Uh, it's so easy to just give up and stop searching. And I think the thing that makes each of these four people so so beautiful and so unique is that they all are searchers. They're all striving. They're all looking to better themselves, to better their lives. Even you could make the same, com- you know, you can say the same thing of the men as you can of the women. You can say the same thing of Reggie, who is experimenting with, uh, you know, psychedelic hallucinogenic drugs <laughs> to achieve uh, some level of spiritual enlightenment could say the same thing of Dennis, who's still pursuing his his dream of being like Hugh Hefner and just not having to pay a dime and live off of, uh, you know, <laughs> the coattails, live, you know, of, of, of an older woman, a, a widow who who no longer uh, mm-hmm. who is looking for company and is lonely. Um, I, I I think it's all it's all in there, and it's and I think it's all about what I think that really is a reflection. Of, at least I've no my perception of what life is. I'm only 25. <laughs> I feel like I have learned many things in the last few years, but I but um my, my perception of what life was like for them w- was exactly that. 
and everything in this film comes from them. Uh, and, you know, I, I find it to be my job to just, how do you, how do you tell these stories in the most interesting heightened ways? Um, but really my job is also to reflect and observe and allow people an immediacy, a closeness to, to these people who I think you can learn a lot from. Okay. Uh, on that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with Lance Oppenheim, director and producer of Some Kind of Heaven. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning director and producer Lance Oppenheim. The film is Some Kind of Heaven, uh, premiered at Sundance in 2020. It drops, as we've now heard, uh, May 15th on Hulu uh, and other places. Uh, and so I would just say go go search the web and I'm sure you will f- find it and it's well worth a watch. Um, I mean, we've, you've already, we've already discussed it. You said, I mean... You were drawn to it, but why, you know, I mean, um, I guess you had your opportunities to make other other films. Uh, why, what was it? Why now? Why, why the villages and, you know, at this particular point in your, in your life? I, 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 I wish I had a better answer for that as a, a you know, I, I think it was a story that I had grown up with and a story that was gaining more in, interest in my mind. But I think I don't. I try not to overthink why I'm interested in a subject. If it, if it's just, I think I like to try and find mm. stories that, um, that, that on the surface, there's a hook, you know, there's a hook to the story. There's a hook to this world. Uh, and then I, and then my job also is to then uh, understand, get deeper and, and, and find kind of a, a unique creative treatment of, of that reality mm. in, I felt that was what this was too. I, I you know, I, I, I wasn't really so interested in, in, you know, the, the whole conversation of me being much younger than, than all of my subjects, I think was sort of less important to me or less interesting. I think it was more of, you know, let's understand why people choose to live here. And for those who don't, who've made the choice, but regret it, or they've made the choice and they are going through some very, uh, peculiar things that in some ways have been augmented by being in the villages that seemed to be of, of interest uh, and, and, and motivate me to do, you know, to make the movie when I did. And was gaining access an issue? I mean, I, you know, you do interview the founder's son, uh, I believe, but uh, um, you know, I think a guy comes around with a camera to the villages. I imagine it starts <laughs> some people t- if they're following Dennis around because he shouldn't be on the premises, I imagine they're starting to ask questions about you or how, how did that work? Well, I mean, it's funny. The first, you know, the first week I mm. stepped a foot there without a camera and I was living, I, I, I lived with in a Airbnb. I rented a room with these two retired rodeo clowns that I found <laughs> online. And I used that moment that, you know, the few, the, like the month and a half I was there scouting and looking around, um, as a, as a time to just see if I could enlist the, the, the participation of the developers, because that's obviously a whole other story. Uh, it's a family run operation. It's uh, the family themselves are very conservative. They're big, uh, you know, they're friends, fans, supporters of, of uh, financially and socially of, of, of Donald Trump and a long lineage of other conservative politicians and they've done something pretty fascinating and in, 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 in basically creating this empire. They've become near billionaires out of doing this. So, um, of course, my mind went there and I wanted to go and talk with them. Uh, infamously, they, they really don't like granting interviews. They like to remain in the shadows. They, they like to be private. Um, and I just, you know, uh, over the course of like almost two years of making the movie, I, I uh, never uh, had a conversation with any of them. I tried to. Uh, I was completely shut out many times. Um, and as a result, you know, I remember the vice president of the villages told me that, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Your story is the residence. And I used that as a, as a way to basically make the film. Um, I had that email. Mm-hmm. I think he was basically telling me to go fuck myself, but I, but I also, um, 
you know, I, 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 I thought it was good advice. So I did turn my, <laughs> I turned my attention elsewhere uh, very yeah. quickly, yeah. less of wanting to make that Wiseman ask institutional portrait, but something mm. much more expressive and emotional. Um, and, you know, as a result, uh, over time, the movie became making the movie. It was almost like an act of several times, like an act of guerrilla filmmaking. I was constantly kicked out of different places. Uh, the, the, the developers, as they got on, as they learned, you know, as the process went on and uh, who, you know, the New York Times is backing of the project, which happened mm. about, you know, early, but sort of midway through production. Uh, and of course, Aaron, Darren Aronofsky's involvement too. Yeah. Um, they they became much more aware of my presence, and I think they like. <laughs> I, I'll never for sure know if this how to you know to what extent they did this, but one shop owner who I became friendly with told me that um, there was almost like a digital wanted uh, poster of my face that they sent around, uh, <laughs> telling people to uh, you know if I if they saw me to call this number and they would have you know villages security. Um, try to escort me from the premises. But the beautiful thing about the, the villages is that because it's so large, because it spans almost four counties now, um, they can't, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of this interesting commingling between uh, private and public property. So uh, mm. in the places they wanted to throw me out, they couldn't because I was with residents on their own private property. And then when I was in their property, when I was, you know, uh, in these, the squares, the places that they uh, mm. would prefer not me to film, uh, they had the right to kick me out. But again, because the place is so big, they just like, sometimes it took a while to find where I was. And by the time they found where I was, I was already gone. Um, yeah. But um, it was definitely a, a ride for sure. And, you know, as the film's been out for a little bit now, um, I, they, I've, I've, I've seen, uh, you know, and they, there was emails that that was sent by the top brass of the administration there telling residents that the film doesn't paint an accurate portrait of life and don't watch it, don't support it, don't talk about it. Um, mm. So I know that it's gotten under their skin, um, but I but it's funny to me because I still don't see this film as a critical or hypercritical portrait of of the community. I mean, I don't I don't um, I see it as I don't even really see it as anything uh, it obviously is set in the villages, but I, I see it more as a setting as opposed to a movie explicitly about the villages. So I find it interesting that they had such a negative reaction to it. But, um, mm. you know, they make propaganda for their residents and that's all they want people to see. So I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. Yeah, no, no it's interesting because I can I would echo what you've just said, because I, I I didn't. I, I didn't think anything about the villages, really. I mean, uh, I, I mean, it's not my cup of tea, at least I can tell you that. But it's, but it is what it is. I think it's more, as you say, it's a setting, and there's plenty of these. I mean, not like the exactly like it, but there's all these sun cities around the U.S. And I think one of my uncles is now retired to some place in Florida that's not uh, again didn't exist 20 years ago. Now it's a relatively large, sort of. I think it's its own city now. I mean, it's uh, these things happen, you know, and, and it is it is something that's very unique. I would say is very uh, mostly very uniquely American. But um, I mean, with that in mind, in terms of the settings and what you're trying to create, I mean, this is uh, this is much more than just this is more than direct cinema. This is very artful and cinematic. And um, um, I mean, I think that was done. I, intentionally uh, and maybe you know you've got some of these amazing shots some amazing cinematography um do you want to say something about your uh, dp uh david bolin and sort of the sort of the the at least visually and we can talk about other elements of this but visually what you sort of what you were trying to create well i mean first off the movie would not exist in its form without david and david and i you know, have known each other now since I was 17. We traded messages online. I've been working with him on all of my short films for the most part. And, you know, he's one of my best friends. So it was, it was a, it, it, it was a natural extension, I think, of a lot of the work and the way of working that we normally do together. But um, the ambition, I think, artistically with this, and every time we work together, we're always trying to push each other to do something newer and you know, the process remains mostly the same, but, 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 but obviously the settings change and mm -hmm. our ability and, and, and thought about how to photograph something obviously changes as well. But across the board, across all the films we've made is this constant thing of, you know, let's think about how very intentionally about where we are, 
what is the setting telling us? Who are the subjects? How can we uh, bring the audience into their world, right? So it's always, that's the first question we ask ourselves. The second question is then what do we, you know, how do we do it <laughs> once, we, once we know? Um, I think for, for this specific film, it was, it was a very, you know, there was obviously a lot of references that I, that I brought to the table, uh, photo books like Larry Sultan's Pictures from Home, another photo series that he did called The Valley, the films that I mentioned, um, mm. you know, Safe, the Todd Haynes film, Edward Scissorhands, Bigger Than Life, Shortcuts to some degree, the Robert Altman film, mm. um, Joel Sternfeld's work, American Prospects. But all these things were in support of this larger idea of, of trying to make the make everything uh, feel just as composed, just as manicured, um, just as intentional as the village's landscape is itself, right? And I wanted to feel and, and bring the audience into that kind of technicolor dream of, of what it feels like to be there. And, and, um, and, 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 and to us, what that meant was, you know, camera on a tripod the entire time, mm. uh, no deviation from that visual style. Everything must be photographed in that manner. Um, and the more we can bring the audience uh, closer to that feeling, creating that Busby Berkeley esque thing also the you know all, and and really just bringing them into this fold of this you know yeah technicolor extravaganza um i think the better off we would be and the more they would be willing to engage with the film as a form of not just as a documentary but you kind of are able to engage with it as you would a narrative film I mean, you mentioned technicolor. It's almost being evocative of the Hollywood of their youth for these, yeah, you know, f for these people there. I mean, and also the music, because I, I was struck that what's that's what struck me. I mean, you could have obviously gone in a different direction and easy to do the boomer music throughout the the thing, but you didn't. You've got an original score, uh, which is quite. Uh, how, I mean, was that again? How did that come about? Because that's um, I thought it was for me. It was quite striking. Thank you. Yeah. And that was another thing too. I mean, Ari Baluzzi and the composer of the film is, a, a, I will work with him as well for the rest of my life. He's this band of collaborators. I feel like we, we really hit our stride with this and I had been working with him on films before this one, but um, Ari is, is a, an, a, a just a, an unbelievably talented person. Um, and I think that was another element too, of, of how do we take the audience into the world of the villages? And there was a lot of, back and forth we had for quite a while of just what does this world sound like? What does it remind you of? And for Ari, the thing he latched onto was that idea of this kind of old Hollywood, mm. old Disney, um, you know, reacting to the architecture of the place and how the place, uh, you know, functioned and, and how people in the place operated. So for Ari, it was a lot of the, the, the Nelson Riddle, the, mm. um, the Bernard Herman kind of the, 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 um, taxi driver, the bass clarinet, you know, a lot of those sounds, a lot of strings, things that take you inside of this melting uh, paradise, so to speak. And I think that was the other thing too. It's like, we, you know, we love, I think across the board, we wanted to get across this sense of this, this is a suburban landscape. This is something that is very beautiful and there's a lot of eye candy on display, but there's also uh, there is trouble in the distance brewing and there is a storm cloud and that storm cloud is only gathering more and more and more. And the, the place starts to walk, look and feel a lot more ominous after you've seen some, you know, some of the stuff that you see in the movie mm. go down. So there was an element of that too, of, of how do you turn the dream into a nightmare? How do we do it subtly? How do we enhance that? Not just through our photography, not just through our score, not just through the edit, but also through color. Mm. And um, yeah. Okay. And I guess uh, your editor played a pretty, pretty big role in this, didn't he? Huge role, huge role. Daniel Garber, you know, he, he gave the movie shape. He, he, uh, he was the MVP if there was an MVP award. I mean, he, he, he really is, as most documentary editors are, he is like a co-author of this film a co-director behind the scenes to some degree of just helping me uh, figure out how to make sense of all of this material, the hundreds of hours of material we, we shot. Um, I think with the edit, our, our, our goal was to try and make this film feel 
as expressive and as impressionistic as as a narrative film could feel while still retaining the the groundedness and the truth mm -hmm. and the authenticity to these folks real stories so there was that ability you know not every editor is able to have i think the foresight and the, kind of the architectural story design a mind that daniel has but um but he certainly brought that to this film and, and unearthed this you know uh, th this this whole uh, the, the beating heart of the movie, the beating heart of the material, which I had never really thought the film or the material could go for or go as far into. And, and you, I mean, is, am I right? If, uh, did you originally foresee this, Some Kind of Heaven is originally as a short, and then it, it became, you were encouraged to make a feature, and then what are the challenges there? Because this becomes your first feature. You've done some great shorts previously, but... Uh, you know, maybe walk us through a little bit of that. Well, I mean, I think the, the film really, really originally started off as my college thesis. And I just figured, you know, I, I would get, I'd try just to raise enough money to spend about, you know, two or three weeks there and see what I come out with. And that will be it. Um, but at the end of the three weeks, I remember just the feeling we all had my crew, we all just looked at each other and we were like, this is, there's something here, you know, we're not, we don't mm. have it yet. We don't have it yet, but there's something here. Uh, we felt, we felt like we were stumbling onto something that maybe didn't quite unfold yet, but the, but the approach, the, the way of the, the you know, the way we were gelling with our subjects, things started feeling uh, a lot different than I think they did on other films, but it was, I mean, it was a totally terrifying process. I had no clue. If you told me that this film was going to become, you know, a feature and, require the amount of work it did and the amount of collaborators it did. I mean, I think I certainly was up to the task and I, I really do love collaborating with people and bringing people onto things and get and, and I think the one difference between, you know, making a short and making a feature, this isn't, you know, this isn't like a movie that costs millions of dollars to make, but still, nevertheless, it does require a lot of collaborators and a lot mm -hmm. more people uh, to, to kind of move that ship, not just, you know, on the ground, not just in the edit, but, really, you know, the producers that got involved were, 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 um, also had a lot of, lot to say. Uh, and, and anyway, I think that stuff, uh, to me was the big difference and distinction. And there were times, many times where it felt like we were, I was jumping off a building and I didn't, you know, I was hoping that my parachute was going to inflate. And that was really what the experience was like of, uh, you know, I feel like we were Trojan horsing and lying and cheating and stealing our way in these pitch meetings to, right. I, you know, I was telling people I knew exactly what the film was, how it was going to flow, who the subjects were, here are the three acts. You know, I didn't know anything, absolutely nothing. The thing I pitched and the thing that we resultantly were, uh, you know, received funding for um, was entirely and completely different than what we actually um, uh, made. But um, I'm all, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to have been working with collaborators on that mm -hmm. side of things that 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 saw what I was trying to do and gave some gave us the leeway to make uh, what we wanted to make. I that 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 raises a good point. We often do. Uh, we have a little bit of a s segment, not not. Well, it, it's weaved into the to the discussion, but on on sort of more career kind of type questions, and uh, often we have older seasoned filmmakers on. But I think it's interesting to hear your perspective because, as we'd say here in the UK, you're right at the coal face. You're you're in the here and now <laughs> in terms of a young filmmaker trying to make it. And what would be your advice? Because this is it is a bit, an, you know, I, I I have some interactions with people in the in the filmmaking world, and I know it's a bit nervy you've you know this idea that you've got to know exactly especially with documentary film you've got to know what the story is you've got to know exactly what the film is when you're pitching it when you in many cases you know it's going to be far different i mean i think <laughs> i honestly think a big part of that is well first lie through your teeth and pretend like you know exactly <laughs> what you're doing uh until you know and, and when you get to the point where you don't know don't tell anybody and just figure it out and, and, and assemble a team of people. If you have the luxury to do so uh, mm -hmm. that will go to war with you and, 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 and uh, will help figure out and make the best thing possible. And, you know, there's that, 
I think to younger filmmakers, I, I really do think there is a big element. I know some people may disagree with me on this, but I've always subscribed to the idea that the closest I could get to the people whose work inspired me the most, uh, you know, th th I think the better off I would be, the better, you know, not just from a you know career standpoint, but really just from a professional, as, as a lover of cinema, as a lover of movies, um, that was always something I could do. And part of that, you know, you have to be able to make your own work. You have to be able to find avenues to get that work made. Once you make the work, you have to work just as hard to get people to see it. And no mm -hmm. one's going to wait around. No one's going to, you know, you, you should bet you should count on no one Googling you or doing anything. You, you need to get your work in front of people and you need to be, you know, so to kind of like selling your mixtape on the street. So to, so, so to speak, uh, find people's emails, reach out to them if you like them and and send them the work you believe in send them the work that you're making um and, that, that, and that's really exactly how this film you know the, this film also wouldn't have been made if it wasn't in some part for for aronofsky and his uh darren aronofsky and his production company coming on board i don't think we would have gotten the financing we had needed to make the film mm -hmm. um and the only way they got involved in the film was because i had been sending him cold emails for the better half of four years, none of which he replied to, but uh, or even looked at. But one of his uh, creative executives eventually looked at and said, "Hey, what what's going on with this? So I was this kid spam emailing you, and he had the mm -hmm. foresight to watch my stuff, and you know, it was very uh, kind. And and we had a meeting, and I told him about this, told me to send them what I had, sent them what I had, and then you know, unbelievably, they they uh, they they all responded to it. So. You do need the grit, you need the perseverance, I think, and you need the ability, I think, it's not an ability, it's really just like sending, send cold emails, you never, it doesn't charge you any money, and you never know where shit's gonna go, you know? <laughs> You know, that goes against all the, uh, and, and I think probably rightly so, goes against all the networking advice I've been given and I <laughs> give out. Uh, cold emails never work. They, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta make your way, you know, you, there's that kind of stuff. But uh, that's really interesting. I mean, did, did they, did he know you had been, did Darren Aronofsky know you had been emailing him all these all these years? Or when I eventually just... got to meet him, I, uh, I think he was just sort of like, what's your... <laughs> Like, who are you? Who the and hell are you? Are you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, so no until his staff informed him. And then, you know, I, I, I think he's he's really um, as talented of a filmmaker he is. He's also a very supportive and, and, and generous collaborator. He, he really did. Mm. Uh, he 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 didn't get paid a whole lot of money. Uh, he didn't take anything from, from, he didn't ask for any, you know, producer fees or anything like that. He really mm. wanted to help get the movie made. Um, and I think there was a kinship in some ways. We went through the same film program in college. I was still in it. He obviously has been out of it for several years now, but yeah. a lot of the touchstones, a lot of the things that I think we both were interested in and the movies that we both like, there is that, 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 uh, that kind of, commonality that common ground that we that we share and uh you know the work that he's made you know inspired me to really make movies to begin with uh when i saw the fountain in theaters when i was really young i that was a movie that truly uh uh mm. you know reshaped what i thought movies could be like and mm. um i remember just moved me on a very fundamental you know way and i wrote my college admissions essay about that movie so i had this I had a, a, a real deep connection with his work and the way he sees things. And that was, you know, I wasn't necessarily angling when I was sending emails to him saying, Hey, I wasn't asking him to produce my movie. I was just saying, Hey, I've made these short films. I'd love to hear what you think of them. I'm, you know, studying through the same thing, you know, your, your work really inspired me to, you know, great lengths. Um, and then very naturally this project came about when they were asking what I was working on and I showed them this. Mm, yeah. So, um, very generous collaborator and you know I, I plan to we're working on another film right now together and that's i plan to keep you know working with him on stuff that's that's great in fact that's one of the next or and also one of our last questions because we're actually coming to the uh end of our time together uh, uh believe it or not but uh <laughs> what what is next for you I'm, I, I feel like I've spent the better half of like this, this entire, you know, however long we've, the 20 years we've been in uh, the pandemic, it feels like um, I, uh, I've been working on a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, I, I've been working on a fiction film with Darren. 
Uh, I'm working on another fiction film, which um, I've, I've I shouldn't say too much more about it, but I'm hoping some mm-hmm. some news will come out about it soon enough. And then uh, I've been shooting another documentary just to get my cam you know hands on a camera. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. I really want to you know keep making documentaries that feel just as heightened and cinematic as this one um, and as my previous work. And I want to make fiction films that also are steeped in the reality and the you know, that, that kind of just observation of, of, of characters as, as the documentaries also feel. So hopefully, um, I mean, honestly, at this point, I just want to make a movie and I don't care what movie it is. I'll just go do it. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to be precious. I, if it doesn't come out great, that's fine. I just want to, uh, you know, want to, want to keep going and keep making stuff. That's very interesting. Cause actually, uh, people tend to go either narrative or doc. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there are obviously some that have done both, but um, you you don't feel like you need to make that decision, do you? You 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 think you can you're going to give it a go at least, or give it a try in terms of uh, try give fiction a try and and see where things lead you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I I think the the ways I have approached documentaries and the kind of the creative treatment of 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 reality and settings, I I, I really do think. Um, from a process standpoint, obviously things are quite different in, in the fiction landscape, but I, I can see many of the stories I've already told, um, whether it be the man living on the cruise ship, you know, mm. that's, um, I see those stories. There's, there is a natural extension to fiction and, a you know, a, a, a preservation of that reality that's in the documentary that can be, um, harnessed and, and examined and, and, and deepened in fiction in a way. And I think, we're in an exciting time. I don't know, no, no matter how one feels about Nomadland, you know, I, I, I personally liked it quite a lot, but um, I think the process of making fiction films that are in tandem and have a hand or a foot in reality uh, will continue to exist. I think like the work of Chloe Zhao is an example of that. There are so many other examples of great filmmakers like Ulrich Seidel who've been doing this for years, but I do think it's becoming a more mainstream concept the safties did it with heaven knows what and uncut gems and good mm-hmm. time i mean it's 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 there's an interest i think that performers have that actors have of playing alongside non-actors or playing inside the la- a landscape an, an environment an atmosphere that is uh that is different than the work they maybe normally do so that's that's um i definitely am very interested in, in, in making that jump making a movie that can be more widely seen and experienced and um wish me luck because it's going to take some time to to do it time and money which is a a thing that uh is i'm very impatient uh you know to wait for but um i i hope i'll I'll get there soon enough um i have a feeling you'll get there uh but and we look forward to seeing it uh your next project and and uh that uh in in the other uh the the many projects to come i'm sure so um i want to thank uh thank you lance for uh for being on the podcast it's been a pleasure having you on and if uh if we haven't scared you off we'd love to have <laughs> you on again sometime so uh, and i'm 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 really digging the uh, lassie photo that's been behind <laughs> you the whole time so thank uh, you <laughs> uh so it's thank you dogs. again for for coming on and um uh, reminding our listeners uh we've been talking about some kind of heaven with lance oppenheim the director and producer uh magnolia films and dog roof and dropping on hulu on may 15th for those of you who have access and other ways of seeing it i'm sure around the world if you have any questions regarding how you can become a documentary director and producer like lance oppenheim or other roles in the industry i recommend you check out careersinfilm.com to learn more about careers in the film industry a shout out to Inner Sound Audio just outside of York, England, uh, our new home away from home. And a big thanks to Nevena Paunovic, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting such great guests like Lance onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. And please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. 
This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.